Sometimes I think I'll never grow old. Sometimes I think I'll never grow old. Sometimes I think I'll never grow old. If death don't get me, life definitely will. When you're 20 years old, becoming 30 is beyond belief. And the only people you don't know are 40. But tomorrow's have a way of arriving bearing marriage licenses and birth certificates and school bills. If your tomorrows are arriving this way, shouldn't you review how you've provided for them? We mean your life insurance. Life insurance comes in so many shapes and sizes. Is yours adequate? How long would income from your present program provide the things you want for your family? Enough can turn into too little too soon. Review your program in this light. Life insurance. When someone's counting on you. Attention. Your attention, please. Will the owner of the 1970 Chevrolet Impala please report to gate 7? Your car is blocking the exit. That's the red Impala Custom Coupe, black vinyl hook cover. The one with a hidden radio antenna, hidden windshield wipers. Chevy with deluxe wheel covers and dual white striped tires. It's the Impala with a 350 cubic inch standard V8 and turbo hydromatic transmission. 1970 Chevy Custom Coupe with rich saddle color interior. A demonstration on a frozen Wisconsin lake. A Goodyear's four-wheel control on ice. It starts with new Pathfinder tires with safety spikes added for the front wheels. And Suburbanites with safety spikes added on the rear. Versus car number three with conventional rear winter tires. And car number two with conventional rear winter tires with safety spikes. Now, all three cars are deliberately driven slowly at only 20 miles per hour. Look what happens when their brakes are applied. Cars two and three skid badly, simulating accidents. With Goodyear's new four-wheel control, this car stops. For this extra margin of safety on ice, get new Goodyear Pathfinders for the front and Suburbanites for the rear of your car. When a man gets up in the morning, I want to tell you he's ready for a hearty breakfast. Hi, I'm Paul Chrisman, and I'd like to tell you about Wilson's certified bacon. This is the bacon that's made to build the kind of muscle that football players need. You know, it's protein-rich and loaded with the energy a guy needs for putting in a very long day. It's the heartiest, leanest, best-tasting bacon that you can find. You see, the Wilson people care about the meat they use. They take marvelous meat going in, so they come out with marvelous bacon, the kind that looks good in the pan and tastes great on the breakfast plate. Wilson's Certified Bacon. Why not tell your wife to try some tomorrow? And if she comes home with a different brand, send her back for Wilson's Certified. Just remember this. It's the marvelous meat that makes the big difference. When you're young, the idea of growing old is almost make-believe. You know it, but you don't feel it here. On stage, the lines help. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. But in life, tomorrow turns into today so fast. I grow old while you're watching me. So do you. Tick-tock, time. And worrying about the future? Because people depend on you. Life insurance is a flexible way to take care of them. Their living, their education. Have you provided adequately? How long would income from your present life insurance provide the things you want for your family? What was enough yesterday? Maybe too little tomorrow. Review your program in this light. Life insurance. When someone's counting on you, 
we're going to drive home a point about new anti-leak Z-Rex antifreeze. It stops most common radiator leaks just like that. We guarantee it will stop and prevent leaks in your car radiator for a full year. Or just write DuPont and get your money back. Only Z-Rex antifreeze is guaranteed not to run out on you. Eve Arden and Paul Ford star in In Name Only, Tuesday night at 8.30, 7.30 Central Time on the ABC Movie of the Week. Then Robert Young tries to help a young man who can't shake the effects of a bad trip on LSD on Marcus Welby, M.D., Tuesday on ABC. and we have three eligible bachelors who are more than adequate for that purpose. Let's meet them, and here they are. <laughs> Fellas, good luck. A former Golden Gloves champion, bachelor number one has little difficulty taking care of himself in any situation. In addition to sporting events of any type, he also enjoys the discotheque scene. We'd like you to welcome Lance Rimmer. Good luck, Lance. And an actor who has been seen on such series as The Name of the Game and Mod Squad, Bachelor Number 2 is also an artist working on his first one-man show. He's from Studio City, California. His name is Joey Hooker. <laughs> Joey? And Bachelor Number 3 would like to be a professional motorcyclist. He's a parachutist. He enjoys scuba diving. He was born in Johnson City, Tennessee. We'd like you to meet Paul Knuckles. <laughs> Good luck, Paul. And that's all I can tell you about our bachelors for the moment. Now, to prevent our young lady from hearing the introductions of our gentlemen, we've been keeping her isolated off stage in a soundproof room. Let's bring her on stage right now. A former beauty title holder, she creates beauty of her own on canvas. And as an accomplished artist and sculptress, she hopes, hopes to open her own gallery. She's from Corpus Christi, Texas, finds relaxation in many outdoor sports. We're delighted to welcome to the dating game, Farrah Fawcett. Hello, Farrah. How are you? Nice to see you. Now, Farrah, we have three gentlemen whom you'll be questioning, of course, and from their answers, you must select the one you think you like the best, all right? Okay, let's start with a hello and see how they sound. Bachelor number one, would you please say good evening to Farrah? What was the name, please? Farrah. Farrah. Mm -hmm. Hello, Farrah. All right, number two, how about you? Hi, Farrah. And number three. Hello, Farrah. All right, Farrah, they are all ready to have your questions? Okay, have a seat right here. Make yourself comfortable. Find it all you can, and gentlemen, good luck. Okay, thank you. Number one. What is your favorite smell, morning, noon, or night? Uh, my favorite smell is morning because it's so crisp and clear. Okay, number two, same question. Well, my, uh, my favorite time is, is morning as well as number one is because it's a, a very beautiful time and it's, uh, it's just the first part of the day and it's just really nice. Okay, number three. Uh, I love the evening. I love to smell the sunset. Okay. Because it's fantastic. If you ever smell a sunset, it is fantastic. <laughs> um, number two, being from Texas, I'm used to having things done in a big way. So how would you make a little thing like sending me flowers really big? Well, if I were to send you flowers, first of all, I wouldn't send them. I'd bring them to you. And I wouldn't bring you flowers. I would bring you one beautiful, small, little rosebud. Oh, thank you. Number, two, number three. I think I'd bring you the biggest rose I could find. I might even... <laughs> Talk someone into making one up. <laughs> okay. Number one, when is a woman really most beautiful to you? When is a woman really the most beautiful to me? Yes. I believe it would be in the evening. Because if, if she can survive the day and she's still nice, she's beautiful then. <laughs> right. Number two, same question. Uh, well, in the morning, a uh, woman's most beautiful as far as I'm concerned. Why? Why? Mm-hmm. Well, um, if they can survive the day and the night, <laughs> then in the morning they're just beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Number three. If you were in charge of everything, what would you make the national pastime? Oh. <laughs> uh, I think uh, jogging, but I'd make us special place for jogging. I'd make it uh, so you could only jog around like a hospital bed. Or... <laughs> Number two. 
Oh, excuse me. I was listening to uh, his answer. It was great. What was it? Sam, if you were in charge of everything, what would you make the national pastime? Oh, I would make the national pastime just love because um, I think that's a great pastime. Really good. All right. That's the signal, Farah, and now you must make up your mind. So relax and think about it while Farah is deciding which of our gentlemen she'll choose. We'll take time out for this message. Stream. Welcome back to the dating game. And Farah, you now must make a decision. The gentlemen over there, of course, are always intent on winning. The question is, which one will be selected in your mind? Will it be bachelor number one, bachelor number two, or bachelor number three? Which one gets the dates? Number two. Number two, all right. All right, bachelor number two, that's terrific. Is there any particular reason, Farrah, why you selected bachelor number two over the other fellas? Because of the flowers. Because of the flowers. You like, he's going to send you that once more. Hey, fellas, hey, please. Are we gonna, do we keep this for air? Okay, fella, would you please, please get back where you belong there, please? Please go over there. You already, you made your choice, number two, correct? You lost a little control. But keep it going? All right. You selected bachelor number two, so let's meet the gentleman you did not select who took it so well. Uh, you did not select bachelor number one. Bachelor number one is a former Golden Gloves champion. Fellas, would you get back behind the screen, please? He is great at all kinds of sports. Obviously, he's uh, been done some boxing. He loves to go dancing. Lance Rimmer. Lance, come on over and say hello to Farah, please. Lance. Thank you. Uh, you also didn't select bachelor number three, Farah. He's a parachutist, he enjoys scuba diving, wants to be a professional motorcyclist from Johnson City, Tennessee, Paul Knuckles. Paul. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, sir. By some coincidence, we couldn't have picked anything more appropriate for you gentlemen this evening than a new Botany 500 sports blazer <laughs> tailored by Daroff. Botany 500 gives you the perfect fit, smart look, and comfort of the finest custom-made quality in luxury clothes. I'm sure you can use it. Paul, thank you very much. Lance, thank you. Well, we have one survivor over there in every sense of the word, and uh, I'm sure you'd like to meet him, right? Okay, let me tell you something about him. He is an actor. He's been in the name of the game, Mod Squad. He's also an artist, just as you. He's working on his first one-man show, so you have a great deal in common. Joey Hooker. Joey, come on and say hello to Farrah, please. Well, Farrah, I think uh, we've gone far enough here. At this point, we've got to unwrap a little mystery for you. First of all, I didn't lose control. This is March 29th. The next Tuesday is April 1st, better known as April Fool's Day which explains our bachelor's demonstration uh, to Farah's decision. They obviously, we're not pleased anyway, the numbers one and three, but these bachelors are fully qualified for that sort of mayhem because they are all well-known movie and television stuntmen. So come on back, fellas, and take a bow. Where are you? Come on out here and take a bow. So realistic. How about a hand, ladies and gentlemen? Lance, nice going. Paul, thank you. Good job. So they really weren't hurting each other, and to take a little of the pain off, if there was any there at all, Joey, we have a date for you. A centuries-old sport has been exploding in all directions during the past decade. In fact, just last year, American enthusiasts plunked down more than $150 million on this new phenomenon. Now, since the dating game always swings with the current fashions, we see no reason why you and Joey shouldn't be a part of that exciting sports scene, too. Which is why we're sending you on a skiing vacation to the spectacular city of... Kitzbühel, Austria. Skiing, that's the sport that's causing all the comment these days. Skiing from a gentle slope in a nearby park to the towering magnificence of the Tyrolean Alps. You and Joey and your dating game chaperone will be winging your way to the winter sports resort of Kitzbühel. You'll be staying in one of the many colorful and typical Tyrolean hotels. You'll enjoy a sleigh ride to the picturesque Castle Munichau. 
There'll be a gala dinner for you in the old stagecoach restaurant, and you'll be delighted when you attend a Tyrolean evening in the world-famous Tony Praxairs on your tour of the Kitzbühel nightlife. By day or by night, it's a magic winter wonderland, so off you go on your skiing spree to Kitzbühel, Austria, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Thank you for being a good sport, Vera. Hey, good job, Joey. Thank you. Aha. <laughs> Well, with winter's icy touch making itself felt throughout the land, we see no reason why we shouldn't indulge ourselves and recall the things we did last summer. Or rather, the things some of our dating couples did last summer. Welcome to today's meeting of the Liars Club. If you don't know what this object is or what it is used for, well, settle back. The tall tales from our celebrity panel are about to begin. First, we'd like you to welcome one of America's great storytellers and president of the Liars Club, Rod Serling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to the Liars Club. And I'd like you to meet some of the biggest liars in town, our panel. First, theater movie critic, Mr. Ralph Peterson. One of our resident liars, lovely Miss Betty White. <laughs> Featured as Jaime the Robot on Get Smart, Mr. Dick Gautier. <laughs> and ABC News reporter, also lovely Miss Pia Lindstrom. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's meet our contestants. They are Barbara Shermer a housewife from Los Angeles, and her opponent, Mr. Bob Hansen, a student from Lomita. Welcome aboard, friends. <laughs> now, our panel of liars know the exact description of each of our objects, but they'll tell different stories about them. And it'll be up to you and to our two lie detectors over here to discover which liar is trying to be honest for a change, and the player who recognizes the truth the most number of times will receive $100. And incidentally, contestants, I've seen none of these things. I'm going to play right along with you. I'm totally in the dark. That's my best spot, right in the <laughs> middle of the dark there. And our first object is in front of Pia Lindstrom. Pia, yes. tell us what that oh, is. Oh, I recognize it immediately. Of course, they've got it upside down, really. But it goes this way, actually. But it doesn't stand that way so well, so I'll leave it this way. This comes from San Francisco's Playland at the Beach, which is an amusement park that was started around 1890. And they had there one of the first, in this area, merry-go-rounds with hand-carved animals that go around. But they didn't use horses. They had pigs and roosters and sheep and other kind of things people like to pigs? ride better than horses. Yes. No. Okay. So most people don't like to ride horses. These you are, like to ride rabbits. pigs. All right. Pigs are very popular. And to make this, they're carved by Roper Fisher Hansen, who came to this country uh, from Belgium, and they're hand carved. And this happens to be one of the gears that drives the pigs and the rabbits around. Listen, that, that'd it's drive anyone around. On, 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 on an old merry-go-round. Well, that's a charming right, story, Jake. unfortunately. <laughs> no, it's, uh, no, I've been up to San Francisco. I used to hang around the merry-go-round myself up there. Met a lot of nice kids. No, actually, what, what this is, this is something else. This has nothing to do with this. This is a ratchet gear here. It twists this like this, and it rolls over. And what it does in the dough, it makes tortillas. They fit in there. <laughs> It makes the tortilla, then you take, and you put in the stuff, and you eat all that slug and that slime, and, and then you puke, and then you're okay. There you are. There you are. All right, Betty White. The Jewish to tortilla. Well, I, I, don't, I don't do dialects, but it's the tortilla thing. Cutter, no, I but. tell you, the only thing that Pia said for that, that biggest lie of all was, was that it is right. It does go this way, but it's used in oil rigging. And, you know, on the oil rigs, they have to sample the, the dirt, first of all, or, the, or the, the strata, various strata underneath. So this goes on the end of another gear and another whole thing that is driven down in the, in the center of the well and it goes way, way down and it twists and kind of bores all the way down and it brings back samples that they can then analyze and find out what the best place to drill is. Oh, that's it's also very heavy. <laughs> all right, well, Peter. Ugly stories for a thing that produces a beautiful sound. This is the, the heart of the low notes on one of the ancient theater Wurlitzers, the mighty Wurlitzers that used to play on Saturday afternoon, how well I remember them. <laughs> this was geared so that it would revolve inside the biggest of the pipes on a, the old-fashioned pipe organ, and it caused the vibrato in those low notes. This, uh, I don't know how the aerodynamics work, but the sound was influenced by this revolving device and the holes and so on, and the air under pressure would go through there. 
Get the vibrato on the low notes in the mighty Wurlitzer. What time is it? <laughs> Oh, my. Mighty world? Okay, Barbara and Bob, I'll recap what our panel of liars have maintained is the truth. Ralph tells us that this is part of a Wurlitzer organ. Betty uh, describes it as being a portion of an oil rig used in drilling. Dick says it's a tortilla maker. <laughs> and Pia tells us that uh, this is part of the gears that drive pigs and rabbits around in the San Francisco <laughs> and something or other. And uh, Barbara, I'm going to let you begin first by picking out who you think is the honest person over there, if indeed there is such a breed. I really have no idea. All right, my dear. Let <laughs> you say we just go out and dance. We'll come back later. All right. Um, I think Mr. Peterson. You go with uh -huh. Mr. Peterson, huh? Many, many people do, you know. <laughs> Mr. Sincere. We don't mention that to his wife. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob, what about you? Well, I, I think Ralph's a very convincing liar. I'll go with Ralph. You both go with him. And I have good taste in sport coats, too, Bob. You know, it's that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Ralph, you're very fortunate you're males attired alike because when women come on a panel and discover they're wearing the same dress, <laughs> there are four hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> I'm the same way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Barbara and Bob, you both go along with Ralph who tells us that this is a portion of a, of a Wurlitzer organ. And Jim Isaacs is going to tell us what it is. The Mission Tortilla Company states that this is a tortilla cutter. <laughs> So Barbara and Bob, you're tied up zip zip, and I know we're going to have trouble with that guy. I can tell it now. We're going to be right back for more of the Liars Club after this message. Although I can't claim very lofty motives in in my drag taking, it did occur to me that there might be a bonus, uh, that I might have, ex that the drags might sensitize me to experiences of a sort my patients could have. And I certainly felt that very strongly um, when I came to see migraine patients and they described all sorts of geometrical patterns and colors which, uh, which I was very familiar with. Uh, we, we, such colors and patterns are often the the prelude to more complex hallucinations with drugs, though sometimes if one closes one's eyes, they're the only differences. Um, also, when I came to work with my awakenings patients, some of these patients um, had extraordinary sensory experiences, which are um, of time stopping, uh, of motion, being split up into a series of separate stills, um, which, which I think is almost unimaginable. But I, I had experienced that myself on LSD, and and I knew what they were talking about, and I, I, I and I knew how confounding it was. So um, on the one hand, one bonus then of drug experiences was that it allowed me to to be more empathic and to understand from my own experiences, what various patients were going through. Um, but um, also, uh, it, um, it gave me some uh, very direct knowledge, if one wants to put it this way, of what um, physiologists were calling the reward systems of the brain. Um, it had been found, for example, with rats. Uh, in the 1960s, that if they had an electrode in certain nuclei of the brain um, and could get a jolt of electricity, um, which apparently gave them great pleasure if they pressed a lever, then the rats might go back to the lever again and again. They would ignore food, they would ignore sex, they would not sleep, and they would keep pressing the lever basically till they they died um, I am um, for for good and evil I think I experienced as many people experience uh, a similar sort of thing uh, when taking large doses of amphetamine uh, it produced um, uh, intense 
pleasure, sometimes pleasure of an almost orgasmic degree, with no particular content, uh, although one could perhaps attach content to it. Um, and um, this sort of pleasure is um, one sort of wants it to go on and on, uh, even though it doesn't really teach one anything, and it may be sort of base in a way, and it almost reduces one to the level of one of these rats pressing the reward center. Um, I think, incidentally, that amphetamines are the most dangerous drugs physiologically, because they will shoot up the pulse and blood pressure, and some of my contemporaries had strokes or heart attacks and died from large doses of amphetamine, and um, amphetamines are now very, very easily made. Um, I, I think they're more dangerous than, than other drugs. This is uh, Robin Williams' first appearance on the, um, on the Tonight Show. Um, he doesn't do many outside appearances. I think I saw him about three years ago. I think he was on uh, with Dick Cavett one night. As you know, he's the star, uh, star of the very successful Mork and Mindy show, which is uh, beginning its uh, fourth season on the air. I begin this Thursday. And he's going to be seen a new film late next spring called The World According to Garth. Did you ever read that book? I read that book. Interesting, yes. funny book. Would you welcome Robin Williams? People always think performers don't get nervous. Not at all, really. Yeah. I don't. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> not really. Not at all. Not really. Not me. No way. Is there some reason you don't do this? Is it the fact that you get nervous? Do you Very do many so. shows? I, I suffer from severe dyslexia, too. Oh. I was the only child in my block on Halloween to go trick or trout. <laughs> here, go, oh, look, here comes that young Williams boy again. Better get some fish. <laughs> here you go. Say hi to your mom and dad. <laughs> oh, where, where is home for you, or did you come from a home? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they said, oh, the people of the institution, Tommy. <laughs> if you haven't taken your medication yet, it's going to be fine. <laughs> They're back at 12. Back at 12, yeah. No. How are you, Mr. Williams? I'm real fine. I'm... <laughs> Look at this thing. Look, Flipper. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> right now, there's a sound man going, What are you doing? Oh, God. I better relax, relax, relax. It's okay. I'm on TV. Right, just... You're a nice man. You won't hurt me. No, no. No, no. <laughs> oh, no, no. Just one second. Sure. Okay, thank you. Don't be afraid. It's just not... I, the sores went away. <laughs> The simplex two is it? Yeah. One. One or two. A real man can stand up to herpes. <laughs> Music has always been important for me personally. I grew up in a musical household. I like, a, um, I like a, a musical background sometimes. Music animates me, it calms me, it consoles me. Uh, it, um, it plays a great part in my own life. But I was fascinated uh, more than 40 years ago uh, when I was working with the patients whom I later described in Awakenings, these deeply Parkinsonian patients, to see the power of music with them. <coughs> these were people who, when the disease was severe, couldn't move and couldn't speak. They were motionless and they were transfixed uh, and no effort on their part would work. But music could sometimes release them and give them a flow so people who couldn't take a step could dance. People who couldn't utter a syllable could sing. And um, this power of music to release people with Parkinson's is very remarkable and very fundamental. Uh, and uh, music therapy was absolutely crucial for, for these people, and it still is. Um, uh, the aspect of music which seems especially crucial is rhythm and really people with Parkinson's, due to damage in a particular part of their brain, have difficulty generating sequences, generating rhythm. Music gives them time, sequence, rhythm, gives them tempo, gives them back their own tempo. Sometimes people with Parkinson move too fast or too slowly. You know, music gives them back a normal tempo. Um, you don't have to have a music therapist uh, if you have a little iPod which plays music, that can do. But music is very, very crucial for Parkinson's. With um, one of the patients, uh, 
uh, who was very musical and who knew all Chopin by heart. Uh, she would, in fact, spend much of the day completely frozen, usually with a finger on her eyeglass, but if one could get her to the piano, she could play. And she was very fond of all Chopin. She very much liked the Chopin fantasy in F minor. So, again. And so forth. However, she didn't actually have to play it on the piano if one simply said to her, Opus 49, this would stimulate its mental playing and its mental playing would be done at exactly the rate of the external playing. It would take just 14 minutes and in those 14 minutes she would be free from Parkinsonism. And the moment the last chord was played mentally, she was back. Get on the 